morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the Mimit Health Live Life Fibroid Free Health Talk on Fibroids and what you need to know. I am Vivian King and I will be your host today. Mimit Health is here to serve you in the best way possible. Take a listen. Welcome to Mimit Health. We're one of the fastest growing physician groups and health system in the country, and we are here to serve you. We specialize in, in minimally invasive uh, procedures, whether it's spine, arteries, veins, prostate, fibroids. We do a wide variety of things, but we're here to solve your problem for you. We have some of the most highly talented, qualified, humble people who are here to serve you. We believe in servant leadership and to care for you. We are ready and available to serve you now. Call 708-486-2600. Telehealth services are also available. Wasn't that a great video? Mimit Health puts the care back into healthcare. And we are gathered here today to talk about fibroids, the symptoms, and most importantly, what are your non-surgical options for relief? A quick question though, before we get started. Ladies, we want you to take a moment and enter your age in the Q&A or chat section of your screen. And let us know if you're in the age group 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, or 50 plus. Also, in the meantime, we want to remind you that if you have questions during the talk, please just submit them in the Q&A or on your screen in the chat, and we will present those questions to Dr. Chopra at the end of the session. To get us started, we are going to hear from someone who was just like you, our patient advocate, Ms. Tomi. Take a listen. My name is Tomi. I'm a registered nurse. I work in the hospital. I've had an experience of uh, fibroids for a couple of years. So during the course of the uh, fibroids, when I was having it, I would be having like a shortness of breath because my stomach is like up into my epig- epigastric area. And each time when I eat, I'll be having nausea. Sometimes I even vomit. So it's kind of very frustrating thing for me. So when I discussed with one of my friends, he introduced me to Dr. Chopra. So the date was set for UFE. Afterwards, like after like two to three months, I started having a little bit relief. Like I'm not going to the bathroom anymore. Not frequently like as it used to be reduced from the preparation room to the to the where to where the position the whole thing did not take more than like three to four hours and I was discharged home. No nausea, no vomiting, no bloating, nothing like that anymore. I'm free. So I would recommend it because uh, it's not firstly it's not invasive that somebody will be caught that um, you will be nursing a wound for ye- for months and at the same time i've seen people going through those procedures like uh, having a surgery that that do not make it i think this is a very good procedure for women that are having a uh, fibro thank you tommy thank you so much in your in our our quick survey and poll we had a variety of we had a variety of women say they were in their 20s to 30s 30s to 40s but the majority of you were in your 40 to 50 age category and i'm sure there are some of you who can relate to those symptoms that tommy talked about So by being here today, you are on the road to recovery, as Toby said. So she is free. Ladies, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Romy Chopra, who is the interventional radiologist and CEO of Mimit Health. Dr. Chomi, I know you can't see me right now, but we can see you. And so I am here and you know what I look like. (laughs) So 
anyway, um, let's get, we're so happy that you're here and let's just get right into this talk because we really want to hear from you. And we heard Tomi in the video talk about, you know, her issues, but let's kind of level set and just share with the audience what a uterine fibroid is. Absolutely. And, you know, let me also share uh, part of my screen and show you some uh, uh, graphics as well. Uh, so uterine fibroids are essentially benign tumors of the, uh, in the uterus. They are non-cancerous growths. They, uh, they can be multiple sizes in different places. They take up blood supply, you know, normally within the uterus. What I'd like to do is step back for one second and put everything in reference here. And the reference is that, you know, the uterus is, is nature's wonderful system for sustaining life. It's the size of a human fist, as you can see around here, you have the fallopian tubes, the ovaries. And if there's no uterus, there's no life. And that what makes women the center of our universe, because without the woman having a child, there's no family. And most of the women today support the family and everything else around them. And the uterus prepares every month as if it's getting ready to have a baby. And the inner lining matures uh, ready for the pregnancy. And if it doesn't happen, we have a normal menstruation, which should be totally painless and without a problem. When we have these fibroids, which you know, normally you have muscle here within the uterus, <coughs> which as if a baby has to expand and grow in there, it expands. And then when the time comes, it's, it's got to push it out. So it's a smooth muscle, just like you have muscles anywhere else. These benign old tumors, they're not cancerous, which is important to know. And when I say benign, they're not going anywhere, but they cause a lot of trouble. Also kind of get a lot of blood. They can be very tiny to fairly large. And that's when they start causing uh, problems for us. Does that make sense to you? It makes a lot of sense. And, and I kind of know that because I had fibroids at one time and we had pictures of them and they were not very pretty at all. <laughs> so what causes uter uterine fibroids? You know, the, uh, there's a lot of research on this and nobody really seems to know. Uh, there have been some studies that have shown that maybe in the African-American community, which where it's very, very common amongst the women, African-American and Latinas, as much as 80 to 90% of women in, in, in those communities will have it. Uh, they linked it to some perhaps uh, use of hair dye, but I don't think that's really the cause. There's a lot of familial and genetic predisposition to this. So grandmas have it, mothers have it, their daughters have it. But uh, most important that it happens in the childbearing uh, age group. So it's linked to estrogen. And as long as there's estrogen, that will grow the, if we need, the, the estrogen is needed for normal functioning of the uh, female reproductive system, but they also support the fibroids. And uh, after menopause, this, when the estrogen's not needed anymore, it's not present anymore, uh, the fibroids tend to shrink. But these days, there's a lot of you know, hormonal therapy, et cetera. So we've started to see them a lot, even in the postmenopausal. So coming back to it, there's no real factor that says you do this and you get a fibroid. It's in, family, it's in families and linked to a childbearing and estrogen. You kind of touched on a little bit of um, my next question, which is going to be how common are uterine fibroids? Um, so everybody can get them, right? And, and one thing you mentioned about the cause, I, I rarely had hair dye. So I don't know that that you know, caused mine or led to that at all. But just, just how, how common are they? amongst it, everybody it is very very common and you see i mean as a woman you know this you're the kind of the center pin for your family as a mother as a wife and a lot of women today are working and supporting everything else so you're used to going through a lot of trouble and not complaining about it and uh, so it's so common that a lot of women even think it's just part of normal growing up etc it's only when it gets really excessive that folks come to me. So, you know, just to show you a little graphic on uh, how uh, fibroids will present, the commonest we see is bleeding and then they become anemic. 
I've had women who as part of their normal cycle were bleeding for three weeks out of the month and they thought it was okay. It's just part of that stuff. But I've had women who've had uh, transfusions every few months. The next commonest thing is a, a lot of cramping, pain, discomfort. Again, a lot of them will think it's just part of their normal menstrual part period, so to speak. There's also a little stigma about talking about this. <coughs> you know, there's uh, the next thing that happens is the fiber gets really big, and I'll show you some pictures in a little bit. Uh, they can cause pressure on the colon and the bladder, and also the, the belly feels big. I've had women come in who thought they were pregnant, and then they found they were not pregnant, and they actually had a massive fibroid. And sometimes then the fibroid itself will not allow the pregnancy to continue and they, you know, they can get miscarriages. Yeah, it's interesting because when I, uh, my, my OBGYN found my um, fibroids, <coughs> and I had not had any symptoms at all. Um, but we scheduled for them to be removed. And it was so ironic that the week of my procedure, that's when I started to have the heavy bleeding. I never really had pain or anything, but I thought, wow, this was, this was just unimaginable. So how are they diagnosed typically? So, you know, a lot of times women will have these problems and then they'll obviously go to the gynecologist or the other doc and then they'll get most likely an ultrasound. And then they're told you have a fibroid. Unfortunately, most of them will jump straight to some big surgical procedure, um, most commonly hysterectomy. And it, it's not just here in the U.S. It's, it's practically around the world that this happens. I like to joke about it. If you go to Midas, you'll get a muffler. Mm -hmm. you, if something's wrong with your tires. So, you know, the folks who treat, who do hysterectomies and don't do fibroid embolizations, for example, uh, don't often talk about it. Now, Uterine fibroid embolization, which is one of the most minimally invasive options for this, uh, can, you know, it's level one recommendation by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And there isn't a lot of information and there's not a lot of this shared about it. And that's one of the reasons why for the last decade or so, I've been around the world raising awareness about this, avoiding unnecessary hysterectomy or unnecessary big surgeries and come up with minimally invasive options. So what we really are here to talk about is how are uterine fibroids treated? So let me actually share a little slide here with you and you will see that um, the, here we go. So the, you know, there's a whole wide variety of things. I, I believe in holistic, a care, which means you encompass the spirit, the mind, and the body. The spirit is where we feel. The mind is where we think. The body is our body. Unfortunately, most care and most of treatment options are as if you're taking care of a car, and it's just on the body. So I see, you know, people talking about, oh, just meditate and everything will go away. Just pray and everything will go away. Or just change your diet and everything will go away. So that's one extreme of this. The other part is uh, where uh, there are some hormonal therapies, et cetera, but they don't just cure it. We've had patients be given Lupron, for example, which is basically a chemical menopause, and it's not something that you really want. On the other end, you have open hysterectomy. Now, these fibroids make the uterus large, so that's the commonest thing that they land up getting an open hysterectomy versus just laparoscopic. Uh, then the next option is the myomectomy where just some of these fibroids are removed. And in there is uterine fibroid embolization where, and we'll talk about this. So just to give you an example, as a woman, what would you choose? Hysterectomy with open surgery versus you have something where we go through the wrist, you go home with the Band-Aid in a few hours from the time you came in. On one hand, you have a big abdominal incision this is a very costly procedure. You're in the hospital for a while. It's painful. It's more expensive to say the least. And when I say expensive, expensive to the body as well. You suffer through a lot. You can get complications, rate, general anesthesia, et cetera. Versus on the other hand, you have something that's easier, it's better, it's faster, it's non-surgical. And to 
make this kind of uh, uh, visible to you, you can see here in a big, these fibroids, they get big when you're looking at a hysterectomy and now you're looking at a big scar versus where we, when we do this, we actually go in through the wrist. What, where do we go in? We go into an artery, just like getting an IV, and we put a tiny little tube under x-ray guidance. We'll get it all the way down into the artery that feeds the uterus and the fibroid, because the fibroid wants a lot of blood, so it takes it, picks it up. We put some particles in it, and that shrinks and stops the blood supply to the fibroid. Just like in your garden, you have weeds, you spray your garden, uh, versus getting rid of the whole garden. And uh, we see then, you, here was a fibroid before with the red arrow, and this is afterwards, after a few weeks where it's done. And in the end, when you procedure is done, you have a little bit of a wristband. This is the spot here where we put the IV, so to speak. And after the procedure is done, about a half hour later, this is removed and the patient goes home. So, you know, you, those are, that's the spectrum, if you would, of the different treatment options that we have. Wow. Because I had a myomectomy, a laparoscopic myomectomy, and I was in the hospital for a, a day, day and a half, maybe. Um, so that uh, UFE sounds like something that I definitely would have considered if I, I had the option and was told about it. And yeah. so I'm wondering how many of our attendees have heard about the UFE. So can we get, there's a poll up now to see if you have heard about the UFE before today. We'll give you a second to um, do that. And we see that most of our attendees have not heard about it. 57%, some of you have, 43% of you have, 57% of you um, have not. And so I guess the next question really is, if I choose the UFE treatment, what should I really expect from that, that time? Yes, so you know, uh, the first, the very first uh, point here is that as we evaluate the patient for a UFE, we want to make sure, number one, that you don't have a cancer or anything else. We make sure that we have an endometrial biopsy, and also we always do an MRI. The MRI then allows us to understand, get the size of the uterus, get the size of the fibroids, etc. cetera. Uh, once this evaluation is done, you know, we take all insurances and, and uh, it is much, much cheaper than going into a hospital. To give you an example, ah, nice to see you, baby. Fun. <laughs> yes, I'm here. I and, do exist, attendees. <laughs> so one, of the, one of the important things to realize in today's COVID era, for example, you know, hospitals, I've said this forever, so we do 99% of our work outside of a hospital. Uh, sick people go to hospitals. And you'll land up, there are a lot of bugs out there, and you'll land up getting all these infections, there's MRSA, there's all these other things. But more importantly, in today's COVID era, you don't want to be in a hospital and grab something. So we are entirely COVID safe. We take every precaution there is. We make sure all of that part in today's world. We do this all in our outpatient centers, where in, just as you heard told me, somebody comes in in the morning. We obviously do this under mild sedation. Uh, we always have an anesthesiologist present, but there's no general anesthesia. It's like getting an IV and some medication. We make sure that you have enough pain medication in case you have pain. And then after that, when the procedure is done, you come out, you have that little thing on your wrist. Now, if you're in pain, what do you do? You want to get into a fetal position. You want to go to the bathroom. You can walk. And so by doing it through the wrist, you know, versus we otherwise can go in the artery on the hip, which is how it was done before, uh, you're ready to get up and walk around. So in a, if you come in at eight, for example, you're ready to go home by noon. Uh, that's the majority of the patients. I've had some patients don't feel much pain at all. Some feel cramping, just like a heavy menstrual period. And especially after the procedure, when the fibroid is now starved for blood, it's going to call out to you and say, hey, I'm hurting. Why are you, you know, what's going on here? And that's the chemical that we perceive as pain. 
So we give you enough medication to block those chemicals. So I've even had women who, and I remember once she had a very large uterus. She was of Indian origin and she and a mom, and they happened to be from where I was in India and they found me through the web. She and a mom actually went and had lunch afterwards when I called them to see how they were doing. So, you know, this compared to being in a hospital, general anesthesia, open surgery, all that stuff. And, and so that's kind of almost the routine uh, that we see. After the first two days, the uterus is kind of responding. So women get some cramping pain. So we say, listen, rest at home for those next two days. We'll give you enough pain medication if you need it. Uh, we try to stay away from the opioids. And then after that, most women, about the third or fourth day, uh, are back up and about and doing their things. And you know, once it's done, we've rarely had a recurrence. I've been doing this for 20 plus years. Uh, and the UFE has been around for a long time. And we'll talk wow. about that in a second, I'm sure. Yeah, because we're, we're that because I had never heard of it. And, and, and until recently, and, and as you saw our poll, many most of our um, attendees had not. But we are getting some questions from our attendees. So I'll launch right into those if you don't mind. Um, sure. One question is, will this treat all fibroids? And what if I have a lot of fibroids? It treats all of them. The analogy that I give is, you know, uh, I call the uterus the garden of life, right? So mm -hmm. every every month it gets ready to kind of have more life. Now imagine you have weeds in the garden, which are fibroids. And what do we do? We spray the yard. So the same way when we do this, it affects all the fibroids. It shrinks all of them. And really what we're trying to do is get you back to normal functioning, stop the bleeding, stop the pain. So yes, it treats all of them. Excellent. And I just threw up the slide if you can see it. Condoleezza Rice, this is public information, of course, it's in the news. In 2004, had this. We are in 2020. And right. we still don't have awareness around this. And I've been conducting a lot of seminars and I've spoken at many churches, as you know, and uh, almost 40 churches in the Chicagoland areas, with Indian Council and other events to raise awareness about this. And the more the conversation around this, the better it is. Right. I mean, I, I had my myomectomy in 2005, so I, I was not told about this, this procedure. More questions. Um, what would you recommend UFE to those who have never given birth? Uh, yes. So here's the thing. So initially when this treatment was actually discovered serendipitously by a, a, a surgeon in France, uh, when he would remove these fibroids, they would bleed a lot. So he figured, hey, uh, why don't we stop the blood supply to the uterus before I do the surgery? And one of the things as an interventional radiologist, one is, if they've had surgery, if you know some women have a uh, C-section or some other surgery and they bleed a lot, they would call us to go in and stop the blood supply to the uterus and save their lives, so that's what we used to do. And uh, we still do that, of course. But then this surgeon discovered that the fibroids shrank and disappeared. That's how the treatment came into being. And I'd like to spend a couple of uh, minutes in a slide just to show you how this works, if, if I may. Mm -hmm. So you see, earlier we did it from the artery on the hip we actually put a small catheter, it's like a long linguine, it's the same that we use for cardiac catheterizations um, and angioplasties. We put that catheter into the artery that feeds the uterus and the fibroids take up a lot of blood. That's what they do. And this catheter, for example, that goes in and then we can put the particles and then we block it. The particles are these benign small little particles. They are like little gelatin balls. There are many different types. And they're so small, they go into the uterus, they go into the fibroid. The normal muscle does just fine. Just as when you spray the yard, the normal grass does fine, but the, the weeds shrink. The same way, uh, we kind of put these particles and we make sure that the fibroid shrinks. So here's an example of a 53-year-old who had almost the size of a six-month pregnancy. That's the fibroid right here. 
and you wow. can see after we had done it, you see the white part that's lighting up here. The mm -hmm. white part is all the blood that the fibroid is taking up. You can see when she had an MRI in three months that it is now completely dry and not white like this. This white here is the bladder. And you see how here the bladder was squished. Mm. Oh, so this lady would go to the bathroom all the time. That's the pressure part of this. The other thing was obviously pain. Oops, sorry. Is the pain that she felt and she bled a lot. Just as the uh, fibroid gets a lot of blood, then the patient uh, would bleed, the lady bleeds a lot. And you can see by the end of the year, all this has shrunk, but her symptoms improve almost immediately. Now, if you have something this big, imagine whether you can have a pregnancy in there. It does because it's competing with the size for the baby. So when the initial treatment came about and this was being done, the uh, treat, it was not studied for whether this is for fertility. This was to treat the fibroid. There are enough studies that have shown that women have gotten pregnant after the surgery. Now, if you have a hysterectomy, you're not going to have a baby anyway. If you have a myomectomy, studies have shown that the pregnancy rates after myomectomy and after UFE are the same. And here you have a less invasive option and the same chance of having a baby. Absolutely. I, I hope that answered the question. I think it did. We have a couple of other questions sure. as well. Uh, like, what is the particle? You kind of talked about this. What is the particle you inject into the artery or fibroid? And is it a chemical? Oh, it's just a particle. There are no chemicals. These are inert. There's no radiation. There's no uh, effect of this of any time. When I say inert, they go in there as the fibroid shrink. These things just absorb and disappear. Do you have to be under anesthesia for this procedure? So yeah. the way this works is when we are conscious and alert, I'm breathing by myself. You ask me to do something, I can give, I can respond. So we have different stages of anesthesia and some people get confused. The far extreme is general anesthesia where you cannot respond to anything. You're paralyzed, you have a tube down your throat, you can't breathe on your own, you can't feed. That is what is required for an open hysterectomy because you can be talking, etc. What we do is what we call conscious sedation or deep sedation. It means that just like if you have a couple of drinks and you feel sleepy and you're kind of numb, we give you a little more than that and there's somebody who monitors your breathing. But if we ask you something, you should be able to respond and you breathe on your own. That is very, very important because there are higher complication rates with general anesthesia. When I say general anesthesia, it's where you have a tube down your throat and you're not breathing for yourself, which is what is needed for hysterectomy. So to come back, what we do this is under deep sedation or conscious sedation, and you basically, no pain for the procedure, and most times because of the medicine we give you, you don't even remember the procedure. That's, that's awesome. Um, and we had another question. Uh, can, you've already answered it. Can you still conceive after UFE? And you said that. Yes, you can. We have a question. Does everyone offer it? And clearly the answer to that is no. And I guess my answer, my question after that would be, why doesn't everybody offer it? So, you know, one is you need the, the kind of expertise to do this. Um, you know, there's there are all kinds of technologies and tools everywhere. The other thing is there's not a lot of awareness about it. Uh, most of the people who do it tend to do it in hospitals, and there's a lot of misinformation around it. But the commonest factor is this. A woman has heavy bleeding or problems. She goes to a gynecologist. Gynecologists are not there. Wonderful people. I have a lot of friends who are gynecologists. I wanted to be a gynecologist when I was in med school. But they don't do this procedure. It's not in their expertise range. There are a lot of other things that they do. So they are not often as aware about this. So they would see if they know hysterectomy, they say, listen, I can do an hysterectomy, I can do a myomectomy, I can give you, put your loop around, whatever. The ones who are aware will pass on the information, but it's really a problem of raising awareness around this. Mm -hmm. And you know, I have patients from all over the world. I've taken patients, you know, from uh, other countries. I've done them from multiple states in the in the U.S. And now with telehealth, it's become even more prevalent. 
and I've had patients who fly in from another state and we've had them uh, stay locally. We've, we've done everything digitally. We are fully digitally transformed organization. Uh, then we have them stay locally. Uh, we take care of them. It's all outpatient. Everything is good. We also have protocols for any, if God forbid something goes wrong and touch wood, we've never had that problem. We have all of those things in place. And that's the beauty of doing it outpatient. Mm -hmm. but, you know, I've had a lady who was in a heavy COVID state. She's bleeding three to four weeks out of the month. She's in heavy, you know, just getting anemic, doesn't want to get admitted to a hospital. We've actually, she drove up here. We took care of her. She's fine. And outpatient, it's essential services versus her being at risk in a hospital. Absolutely. We have some, some, some questions uh, that you've kind of talked about, but just, you know, if there's any other nuanced uh, answers you want to give. Sure. Um, one person says, you know, can UFE harm the uterus? It sounds like it doesn't if we no, can get pregnant afterwards, right? Uh, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. Now, you know, just as if there's, uh, you'll see reports in the literature of some, had some problems. Now, you know, in the right hands, any tool, if you're a chef and you don't know how to cut, you're going to cut your hand. You can't blame the knife for that. Uh, similarly, <laughs> but they're, they're, it's a very, very safe procedure. Mm -hmm. And then um, we have someone who says, um, you know, and you kind of talked about this as well, um, is UFE for all types of fibroids. They really don't want surgery, but UFE sounds great to them. Yes, it's for all kinds of fibroids. And the uterus has two arteries. So from your garden, you have one artery on the right, one on the left. We get into that and we hit the whole garden, the whole uterus, and it shrinks all the fibroids. That's awesome. And, and you, you kind of touched on this as well, um, but someone is saying it's done by a radiologist, correct? As opposed to, like you, their OBGYNs, they're not going to yes. necessarily have this expertise. Yes, yeah. So, you know, we go through extensive training. Uh, earlier, the people got confused by the word radiologist. But mm -hmm. what it is, is that interventional radiolo radiologists are like minimally invasive surgeons. And in the past, you had to first become a radiologist, understand imaging, and then specialize in interventional radiology. Now, interventional radiology is like a surgical specialty. It has its own training program, but we learn imaging. So the best way to describe this, if you go back, you know, we fight a war against disease. So here we are fighting a war against the fibroid, so to speak, right? Now, in the old days, when there were wars between countries, when Germany and England, they did carpet bombing of the whole city, right? So that is open surgery. You'd have a lot of collateral damage. How, is, how are they doing it today? Under imaging, which is laser, they will watch in night vision, just the bad guys and try to knock them out. That's what we do as interventional radiologists. I kind of, you know, jokingly, I'll explain to people, we are like the Navy SEALs. <laughs> you know, like that. <laughs> the equipment will get right into the point because we use the same technology to treat cancers in the liver and in the lung other places we want the least amount of collateral damage and then we want the patient to obviously not suffer from any pain but we also want it to be cost effective i call it the amazonification of healthcare you do it better you do it faster and you do it cheaper and as humans, what do we want? We want to live as long as we can. So we hate dying in any kind, no matter how old you are. And we want a great quality of life. And for success, in my mind, is fulfilling your God-given potential. So how can you do that if you're bleeding three weeks out of the month? Or if you're in severe pain, how can you be a good mother? How can you be a good wife? How can you be a good lover? And that's one of the commonest things we see is that their sexual relationships with their partners suffers a lot. And that leads to all other emotional, psychological, spiritual issues. And a simple treatment like this, I've had patients I took care of 20 years ago when I first started this. They're still friends and they do great. I've done this on family members. I've done this on friends. I've done it patients who become friends. So, Yeah. Yeah, you would be my friend. You're already my friend, but you would definitely be my friend if you did this for me. <laughs> we have a question. Um, will I stop having menstrual cycles or periods um, and how long before <coughs> you're back to normal? Yes. So the, what we commonly see is 
the they so most of these women come to me they're bleeding like crazy and they don't complain if they're not bleeding anymore <laughs> right so we see that there's amenorrhea which means for the first month or two they may not have a period then they will get closer to getting back to some period uh, and then get back to a normal rhythm that's one we have very few who are close to menopause who will never get a period again and they are totally happy about it Mm -hmm. Then we have some who we do the procedure, but because they've had some residual blood will bleed for a little bit, stop, and then come back to a normal rhythm as well. But, uh, and we are very careful of not letting these particles go to the ovary. Just as I mentioned, if you have a knife and you're a chef, you should know what to cut and how to cut. The same way, we only want to go into the artery of the uterus. And there's a connection with the ovaries as well. And we make sure that we are not injecting anything to the ovaries. So we don't want the ovaries to fail. Uh, somebody who's new at this or has not done it well enough could potentially put particles somewhere else, mainly the ovary, and that could kill the ovaries. We don't want that. Mm -hmm. So we have had several questions about, you know, how much this costs and if, if insurance covers it and if and what insurance you accept as well so we accept all insurances number one now some insurance plans and there are a few and i don't want to name them off of loud here but they kind of will fight around it and say oh well it's you know not it's investigational but it's just one or two plans that we know of but we cover all and it's compared to a, a, a hospital we are in when we do an outpatient it's almost one fifth of the price and we for those who don't have insurance we will even work with them and make a payment plan but trust me it is very inexpensive compared to all getting a hysterectomy absolutely um what would you recommend for women who have a predisposition to diabetes or other hereditary diseases? Yeah, so the, we focus on wellness first. Mm -hmm. See, unfortunately, people run around looking for diagnosis one to the other. And I, I get this, I have patients all over the world, and they'll say, well, you know, what's my diagnosis? And I'll ask, how do you feel? And they go, I think I have this. And I'm like, stop, I asked you how you feel. Mm -hmm. What I mean to say is you've got to focus on health first. So sugar is the enemy. Uh, as we all know, smoking is the enemy. So you want to get yourself healthy because just as we're learning in the COVID situation, you will start to deal with problems better. You know, I teach my team this and people that I uh, can influence in my life is, and I live by this adage, that wellness and happiness are not the absence of problems. They are the presence of solutions. Mm, yeah. So repeat that. Mm -hmm. Wellness and happiness are not the absence of problems. They are the presence of solutions. So if you, you know, if you're congenitally diabetic, but there's still solutions, manage your blood sugar, get your insulin, all that exercise regularly. And you don't have to be a triathlete, just basic stuff. You know, we teach our patients how to meditate, do yoga, uh, get into a very healthy lifestyle, and then you can deal with the problems of life and solve them and be joyful and happy. Dr. Chopra, we have um, kind of more questions about um, the particles and the, you know, the artery. And I know you talked about you're like a medical Navy SEAL, <laughs> but um, one question is, is there only one article, uh, artery, I, I'm sorry, that feeds the uterus? And if I have four fibroids, are you injecting into four arteries? Oh, he, no, so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So let me show you this picture here, if you can see that. Yeah. You see, we get into the artery, whether I get in from the wrist or from the artery around the hip. The uterus, you know, we have things on both sides, right and left. So there's one artery on the right to the uterus and one artery on the left to the uterus. So again, think of your garden and think of it that you have a right entrance and a left entrance. And there's one pipe into each. What we do is we get into the pipe that feeds the uterus and you may have 50, 5 or 1 fibroid, one big one. We don't go after each fibroid. We'll get into this artery, like you see this catheter here, and it feeds the whole uterus. So it's mm -hmm. one on each side. Okay. And particles, as I was describing earlier, are these fine little particles 
that are basically the ones we use are basically fine gelatin balls. Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, I'm sorry, what was that? So basically, uh, these are little gelatin balls. As you can see, they're floating here. And this is what gets into the body, into the uterus, and the body just absorbs it. So okay. there's no radiation, there's no medication, there's nothing. And these are small, little, inert, it's like tapioca floating, but yeah. these are fine. There are other, some people will use other types of particles, but that's what this is. This is a, a detailed question. Um, yep. Someone just got told yesterday uh, that they have fluid in their right fallopian tube because it, uh, re she, re she recently lost a job and insurance and uh, they sent her home. She's in pain. So how dangerous is it to wait until she gets insurance? Um, so how truly dangerous uh, is it? You know, I don't want to give medical advice on a webinar without seeing them. But right. if you're in severe pain, I would make sure you evaluate it quickly uh, on an emergent basis. And that's called a hydrocell things that they may have. It could be unrelated to fibroids, but if you are in severe pain, at least have it checked out to make sure there's, there's no ectopic pregnancy, there's no, nothing else going on in there. So I would get it checked out sooner than later. Um, one person said, my doctor said my uterus is very enlarged, like a 20 week pre pregnancy. Would I still be a candidate? Absolutely. I'll mm -hmm. tell you one patient who uh, found me on the web. She basically thought she, she's fit. She works out. She does everything. This is right in Chicagoland. And uh, <coughs> she uh, found us on, I think, Google or something. And uh, she watched one of my videos. And she came in and she had a fibroid, which was almost up to her diaphragm. So mm -hmm. that's a full-term pregnancy size. She thought she was putting on weight. Then she thought she was pregnant. So when she went and saw them, they said, well, you got to let's collect enough blood and i'm sh I, I i swear i'm just quoting it she said you know you'll you'll bleed like a stuck pig and we make sure and you have a 50 percent chance of survival with open surgery means out of 100 she had a 50 percent chance she'd come back home so she was panicked she actually found me on the web and called the office when she left that that surgeon's office today she's doing fine we we were able to get it from a wrist to both sides and she's done great so no matter how big it is, we can do it. But we make sure we assess everything. There's no cancer there. There are no other problems. We study everything else and, and work our way from there. Um, has any research been done about this procedure regarding cancer or other issues? Yeah, this has been there. Hundreds of thousands of these that have been done around the world. Yeah. Uh, they don't cause cancer. But one of the things we make sure is that there is no cancer in the uterus. If there is cancer, and when you say malignant cancer means it's going to spread and kill you, we want it out of there. Mm -hmm. If it's benign and it's not a malignancy, then you can do the UFE. And one person is asking, why not through the hip anymore and now through the wrist? And is there a choice? Absolutely. I could do either. You know, I can walk into my house through the front door, the back door, or the window. It's if the, you know, the wrist is way easier for the patient, it's the same for me. And there's a few patients who, because the anatomy can change, they may not, I may not be able to do it through the wrist. For example, we go in through the radial artery, but we always make sure that the ulna artery, which is the other artery, is, to, is fine. If they are, and if they are not a good candidate, then we go through the artery on the hip. Mm -hmm. Both are easy. <laughs> easy for you. <laughs> Have you seen LeBron dunk a ball? This also, does this also help for endometriosis? Yes, it can. So mm -hmm. you know, adenomyosis and endometriosis. But again, we evaluate to see what all is happening and how, how, how their symptoms are, et cetera. Right. Um, and so regarding kind of the cancer um, question, someone says, so do you perform a biopsy of the uterus first? So what we do is actually, first is we do an MRI. If it looks normal, then you don't need to do a biopsy. The other thing we do is an endometrial biopsy, where the inner lining is checked to make sure that there are no cancer cells there. So the answer is yes, we do an endometrial biopsy. 
um, after a surgery, how do the fibroids die? Um, are they released during your period or using the restroom possibly? So the, the, as I was telling you earlier about the different types of fibroids, and I'm going to show you a picture very quickly, and that'll explain it to you as well. Uh, if we have a fibroid that is what we call, um, uh, in, 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 let me just show you the screen, and that will make sense to you. Okay. So when we have a fibroid that we call is pedunculated and submucosal, as in inside the cavity, rarely this will shrink and kind of get come out like a clot. Most of them, like the one we see here, will just stay in one place and just shrink away. And for example, if you see here, the blood vessel, when it goes here, as the blood supply to this is cut off, just like the weed in the, your yard slowly shrivels away. Rarely, as I mentioned, if it is inside the uterus right here, what we call a uh, submucosal pedunculated fibroid, this, as it shrinks, may break off and, and is, goes out like a clot. But 99% of these are just in the muscle and they just shrink away. Wow. We have a question here. Um, having an IUD may affect the procedure? This no. The question, and does IUD need to be removed before or after the procedure? Uh, actually, not, no. Uh, I mean, if you have an ID, it doesn't come in my way at all. Uh, we are getting into the RE and we block the bleeding uh, at the blood supply, so no, it doesn't. The IUD is kind of a completely separate purpose, whether it's to prevent the pregnancy or it's medicated for some women, especially who are having abnormal bleeding around per perimenopausal, they sometimes get an IUD with the medication to help them. But it doesn't stop this procedure. If you have a fibroid and you happen to have an IUD in there, I can still do the procedure. And then one final question before we totally wrap up. Um, actually, a couple, couple quick ones. Um, how long after the procedure do you see relief from the heavy bleeding? What is the follow-up? What if you no longer get your cycle? Would, would, could you make it come back? And can an IUD shrink a fibroid? So let's, there were a lot of questions in there, but the, I know there were, I thought they were related. They all popped up at the last minute. So I, I want you to answer all of them though. <laughs> so the IUD will not shrink the fibroid. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if you don't have your cycle, this won't make it come back. Uh, in this procedure It's not related to that. So as far as how long do you see the relief? Uh, most of them we see it immediately. Uh, but then some have some spotting for a while but that heavy bleeding, cramping, all that starts to go away almost uh, immediately or within a few days. Dr. Chopra, thank you so much for your time this morning and answering the questions. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we, I was gonna say, we hope this information has been helpful, but by all of the questions, it seems like, um, it has been very helpful. And, and Dr. Chopra has answered so many really nice, even specific questions in addition to the general questions. And in the, in the chat, people are saying, thank you, very helpful. So if you are looking forward to connecting with Mimit Health, I saw somebody in the chat earlier say they wanna to talk to you now um, to discuss their situation, uh, then you can definitely do that. You can call Mimit Health, and the phone number is area code 708-486-2800. And then uh, the website, www.mimithealth.com. I see one person saying, please answer me. Let me see what I missed. Um, she says, I had uh, removed my fibroids last year, but my doctor said, she was not able to remove it, so she removed par part of it, but it got worse after the procedure, I'm thinking. Yeah, well, basically it means she still has some fibroids and okay. probably the fibroids are getting worse. She could be a very good candidate for this, but obviously needs to get assessed. So, um, yeah. yeah, so if it needs to get assessed, you know, perhaps you are a candidate to... Um, Absolutely touch base with 
Mehmet Health and Dr. Chopra uh, so that you can discuss that situation um, because she says it got bigger after two months. So that, that it, it must be um, a fibroid. One last question, can the fibroid come back at some point in time after UFE? So the ones that we have treated don't do, don't come back. But you, can you get a new one? Yes. But, you know, I've treated hundreds and hundreds of patients and I've never seen that happen. Um, and uh, rarely, like I showed you the uterus, uh, there's a blood supply that can come from another part. So out of maybe one out of a couple of hundred patients, we see that they may get blood supply from somewhere else. And it doesn't come back. What happens is they get blood supply from somewhere else. But mm -hmm. I haven't seen that in my career, but it's been reported. Mm -hmm. I think we may have, you know, either a poll for our audience or at the very least, hopefully, oh, here's a poll. Yes. Um, if you guys, ladies, I should say, could um, fill out this survey, that would be get great. We'll give you a few minutes to do that. It will not go to the entire group. It will go to um, just the host and panelists. And so we will keep your information confidential. Um, and then after this poll, we will definitely show you a slide that will give you the phone number. Um, and I can even, uh, while you're doing your poll, I can even put the number in the chat as well. Yeah, the easiest way is to go to our website MimitHealth.com, M-I-M-I-T Health.com. There you see it on the screen. Um, yes. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Again, this has been, I wish I had um, talked to you in 2005, Dr. Chopra, because I definitely would have, um, in, I would have rather have you go through my wrist instead of <laughs> It, through my my belly, but it, at least I wasn't out too long. But I was in the hospital for a, a day or two, so <laughs> and it was a little uncomfortable. What's very very important to know is today with the COVID nineteen situation, the chance of you getting COVID goes way up if you're in a hospital where they have COVID patients. Right. Uh, second is the cost part of it. So outpatient recovering at home and all that stuff is way better than being in a in a hospital situation so that changes the paradigm tremendously today yes absolutely absolutely well it looks like we've got um people who have um just been been great uh they have said they've heard about this from an email from a friend from social media um a hundred percent said this information today was helpful oh, and then 92 percent feel that they are ready to address their fibroid condition i think that is a definite win yeah, thank so, you. i'm grateful that uh folks found this uh helpful and thank you for giving me your time on a on a saturday morning and i hope we can be a solution for you and you know what, well, you were on Channel 5 this morning and someone saw you on Channel 5 this morning. So oh, okay. um, Thank you. they Good are great. Day. They have had no idea how she got the email, but this has been so helpful. She's ready to fly back to Chicago to see you, Dr. Chopra. Oh, so you, you are going to have personal, personal visits from our ladies. Thank you. If I can be of help, absolutely. It's a blessing. Well, thank you all. We're going to end our... Um, webinar this morning but you have put in your information for Mimit Health to find you and then again if you did not definitely follow them on uh, visit their website follow them on Facebook and you have the number and the, the the website and so you can be in touch and this will also be available on YouTube uh, for others who may have missed today and who want this information. You can be a witness to them and tell them, go on YouTube to hear what Dr. Chopra has to say. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.